So warm welcome to this cross-border seminar, which is called Developing Kraken's Non-Wood Forest Product Sector, Examples from Finland and Sweden. So the concentration area in the seminar is Kvarken, which is the region in the Gulf of Bothnia, basically from Vasa to Umeå. And most of the examples in the seminar are from this region, but we are handling non-wood sector in a very also broad way, so at a larger scale. So I believe there's something for everybody to take home from the seminar. Uh, my name is Ida Viholainen and I'm working for Finnish Forest Center as a project manager in different international forestry projects. And today I will be sharing this event. And uh, as a co-host or, or a facilitator for this event, we have SLU's Elias Anderson, uh, who is uh, following questions and, and running the, the presentations. And if there will be technical uh, problems, I hope that he can answer to those. And next, I would like to go through with you some of the basic rules of Zoom, which is the system that we are using now for the seminar. So it would be easy and nice for everybody to follow and participate this seminar. So I, I hope that please keep your microphones off when others are speaking to avoid echo so it's easier to, to listen everybody. And cameras can be open, but it's not compulsory, however you feel most com comfortable. And now we have the general uh, section and after this we will have discussion groups and which are smaller. And if possible, we would prefer that the cameras are on and questions preferably in the discussion groups but short questions can be also asked right after the, the speaker's uh, presentation and if and when you would like to have a have a speaking turn you can raise your hand there is a toolbar for that uh, in the in the zoom and uh, if you're not familiar with that you can you can ask now or, or you can also ask questions in the chat area. And this general section will be in English and, and in, the, in the question answer discussion groups, the discussions can be, and the questions can be asked in English or Svenska yes, or Maxi. And we hope a very active interaction with you and uh, an interesting and uh, fruitful seminar with you. So here is a bit of the program that we will have for this afternoon. I will tell of the, um, the background of the seminar. Then we will have Lena Faven uh, from, from Centria, University of Applied Sciences. Then Alm Newman from Kaaba Forest. And Kim Finne from Arctic Birch and Martin Bayou from SLU. Then we will divide uh, will divide into discussion groups of mushroom, berries, and sap. And, and then we will come back. It, take, it will take about one hour, and then we will come back to the, this main seminar room and sub, sum up our results of the discussion group, groups, and we'll think about the next phase of this project and our, our results of the discussion group. So, I will, this, this seminar is a part of a Prosperous Forest Project, and maybe you've heard of it in, in Sweden, it's called Rikare Skog, and in Finland, Enemman Metsästä. It is, um, the basic idea of this project is uh, to provide uh, consumer-led forest services to support forest owners' decision-making. Making. And, and the objective is to combine knowledge and expertise of different actors from forest owners, forest service entrepreneurs and companies to increase the competitiveness of, of companies. And what we have basically now done is that we have mapped out all the services in the project area and organized workshops uh, with forest owners and, and companies. And based on that information, we have designed pilots and training material for, for SMEs. 
and support forest owners' decision making. We also identified that non wood forest sector is a very underdeveloped uh, sector, and uh, forest owners do not know much about the sector, and few SMEs exist providing those services. So with this seminar, we want to understand the challenges and possibilities of the non-wood forest sector and what we can learn from each other from these two countries and bring together expertise and stakeholder groups with this seminar. So we are part of uh, Interreg Botnia Atlantica program, which aims to support cross-border project work in Finland, Sweden, and Norway. In this main project, we are working in Sweden and in Finland. And in that photo, you can see the, the Botnia Atlantica project area. The project started in 2018, and it will last till the end of next year. And project um, cooperation in this project um, happens with uh, SLU, Sveriges Landbruk Universitet, Rurali Institute of the University of Helsinki, and forest, Finnish Forest Center, and Skogsturelse, the Swedish Forest Agency. So that's, that's about my background and, and the background of this seminar. And I would like to give the floor to Lena now to, to present her, her thoughts and ideas. So Lena works for the University of Applied Sciences, Centria. Welcome, Lena. Thank you. So hello, everyone. Um, I am working at Centria University of Applied Sciences and also in the research and development uh, group at chemistry and bioeconomy especially. And uh, today I would like to tell, give you an introduction to the world of non-wood forest products. And I have to warn you that my approach is more or less uh, uh, business and technology driven. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the definition of non-wood forest products, the demand and opportunity, uh, the status in Finland, status of industrial manufacturing, and give some global examples of needs and businesses. And finally, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the quality characterization, characterization work and also give you some uh, examples of test results of the uh, samples. So non-wood forest products or non-timber forest products or natural products, there are uh, several different definitions, but they all mean basically the same like berries, leaves, bark, etc. But at Centria Chemistry and Bioeconomy team, we are treating those as biomass, meaning that uh, there are similar processing technologies and quality control methods applying for both wild and cultivated biomasses. So we are uh, handling and dealing with wild and cultivated berry, berries, uh, residue biomass from logging and wood processing, and also there could be side and waste streams from biomass, for example, from food industry. So there is a lot of uh, opportunities to refine these um, biomass-based raw materials into high-value added products. And here I have logos of three different projects. Um, two of those more and this uh, novel body are currently ongoing and industry node it has already ended, but I will tell you some results from those projects as well. So there is a global market demand for high quality, authentic non-wood forest products, such as health food, superfood, cosmetics, hygiene, or even pharmaceutical products. And at the same time, there's a huge opportunity. There are plenty of high quality Arctic or Nordic raw materials uh, with high concentrations of valuable ingredients and mainly due to the long daylight hours during uh, growing, season, growing season. So here I give you an example of value growth uh, for the Villaberry case. And of course the prices can vary depending on the crop, annual crop. So if it was like 1.4 euros per kilogram, 
uh, picked and then picked and cleaned four euros and for powder four hundred euros per kilogram. And if it's sold as an extract, uh, it could be three thousand five hundred euros. And in, if it's sold as anthocyanins, uh, it could be more than ten thousand euros per, per kilogram. So there are plenty of opportunities to refine these high value um, raw materials into high value added products in the Nordic countries. Here I'm showing you a mega trend analysis from Euro Monetary International, which shows well uh, that it, it is supporting the non wood forest for us uh, opportunities. The um, statistics is a couple of years old, but in my opinion, it's still very valid. I have highlighted in red some of the keywords like premiumization, authenticity, health is the new wealth, transparency, brand identity, security and health. In Finland, uh, we have had national non-wood forest products action plan since 2014 and the work was coordinated by the University of Helsinki Ruralia Institute. We have had a bioeconomic strategy since 2014 and the non-wood forest products have been included in that strategy and currently it's being updated. We also have had our sector reports for the national product sector since 2015. And um, also the annual statistics for wild berries and mushrooms picked for sale. Like in 2019, you can see the numbers that were picked, uh, uh, the amounts that were picked for, for sale for bilberries and lemon berries. However, uh, the fact is that uh, almost 90% or even more of, of wild berries are left in the forest annually. So which means that there is a bottleneck, especially if you are refining. Uh, there are a lot of raw materials, but uh, it's not refined to a full extent. Of course, we need to be sustainable as well. I'm not uh, saying that it, it's not sustainable, but in a sustainable way. Some words about the status of industrial manufacturing, because there are many profitable, medium and large scale enterprises. And the business has been growing, uh, particularly in Central Europe, uh, North America and Asian countries. Here you can see some examples of turnovers from European enterprises like Naserex, 405 million euros, the Italian Indena and the Swiss Linnea. Uh, these companies uh, use typically both cultivated and collected wild plants as raw materials. The raw material collection and harvesting is done according to good agricultural practices and uh, they conform to international standards and good manufacturing practices. So it's very important that the whole value chain um, is traceable. These companies typically also invest in research and development. So how could Nordic or Arctic industry compete with the Asian enterprises? Um, obviously, uh, we need to have transparent and traceable manufacturing from raw materials to finished products. And it's important to show the proof of quality. Uh, we need to have high level quality standards. And it's also very um, beneficial if the raw material is organic or wild. Yeah, you, one could also pay attention to reduction of manu industrial manufacturing costs, like you could look into the, if you could uh, utilize waste energy. This is an example from a from the industry Nordic project and uh, showing just the, that the value is close to customer. And, uh, how to add volume and value uh, in the case of Nordic berries. You, you should uh, focus on consumer products, high-end segments in the selected export markets and brand building like Arctic cleanliness and premium content. Uh, the focus should also be on various health benefits and origin. It's also recommended uh, to cooperate in marketing. Some examples from global demand, and this case is from Germany. Uh, there is an aging population which needs more health food and wellness products. And the value of natural products is constantly growing. So there is a huge a potential for high quality Finnish or Nordic products. In the United Arab Emirates, uh, they have 
the highest rates of obesity, diabetes, two cardiovascular diseases in the world. And the government has uh, increased its efforts to fight common health diseases. So uh, the uh, health and wellness food product saves has been something like 1.25 billion US dollars some years ago. This is an example from an Italian company called Zuccari. And as you can see from the photo, they are utilizing almost all parts of the tree. This company was founded in 1993. They make food supplements and cosmetics. They have sales in 34 countries. And some years ago, their turnover was 11.5 million euros. And the birds trees come from Finland. It's, uh, some examples uh, from birds. Uh, uh, the biggest manufacturers have not been from the Nordic countries so far, uh, but they have been from UK, uh, uh, USA, uh, France, but they are uh, lose, using SAP from Eastern Europe and Latvia, for example. Products can be typically drinks and food, pharmaceuticals, food supplements, cosmetics and hygiene. Uh, the Finnish Nordic Koivu and their tapped brand sold in 2015 worth 250,000 pounds of their SAP products. And according to the new nutrition business forecast, the wood and plant based water business should grow into. No, sorry, I can't see it now and don't remember. It's a, it's a big number. You can take a look at it afterwards because these are available for all participants but a big number the forecast in 2025. Uh, some examples about the quality characterization work at Centria. So this is an example from the Nordic Industry Nordic project and uh, we have uh, the analysis results of minerals and sugars of birch sap and we have analyzed hundreds of birch sap samples from several forest owners during several years. An example about the uh, bilberry or blueberry. So the bilberry is it's the wild berry and blueberry is normally uh, the cultivated berry. So if, if it's sold as a powder, how can you tell if this is uh, the powder is um, bilberry or blueberry? So at Centria, we have developed the analysis method total called total phenolics. And um, as you can see in the graph, the concentration of total phenolics for bilberry powder is higher than in blueberry powder. However, it is very confusing because on the market, you can see different terms, wild blueberry, so what it is. And also for marketing are used like antioxidant, antioxidation or antioxidant capacity. Well, at Centria, we have also developed the methods for um, uh, antioxidant capacity measurements and here you can see results of uh, antioxidant capacity and uh, total phenolics and antioxidant capacity correlates well with the total phenolic concentration and results for uh, several uh, different uh, raw materials. The higher the antioxidant capacity or total phenolics concentration is the uh, healthier it is. Here are examples of analysis results of five different bilberry or, or blueberry powders. As you can see, the concentration of total phenolics varies depending on species, treatment methods, or region. That is why it is very important that the methods have to be the same between the buyer and the vendor if the results are compared. And here you can see um, uh, result from in a novel Baltic project where the uh, total phenolic concentration of a sample, sample from Finnish company uh, is analyzed by three different laboratories, namely University of Latvia, Lithuanian uh, Agricultural and Forestry Research Center and Centria. All laboratories have used their own methods and the methods of the other laboratories. As you can see, uh, it's not exactly the same, so there is some variation in the results. And to conclude, the question remains, how could Nordic enterprises sell their products as premium products and get, a, get better prices? Of course, 
uh, they should show proof of quality and possible proof of authenticity, because there are also fake products on the market. It's good to tell stories uh, behind your product and uh, company history, for example. Uh, you should invest in marketing and packaging. So here you can see our partners uh, in three different uh, Nordic projects in Industry Nordic, where, where we had uh, SLO as a partner and the three uh, Swedish municipalities, Wilhelmina, Dorothea and Åsel as target groups. And more NBPs where we are focusing on uh, drying development and optimizing drying processes. It's uh, Luleå University of Technology and Husholm Cells Carpet from Sweden. And Novel Baltic, uh, which is focusing on the development of quality and authenticity develop uh, methods and market demand in China and also the feasibility of technologies. Uh, so laboratories from Norway and Baltic countries. So thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'll try to answer to those later, oh, maybe. Thank you. Thank you a lot, Lena. And if you have quick questions now to learn or if there is something on the chat, uh, please, um, please you can ask them now. I don't know if Guna have, or oh, Guna put her, her uh, time down. So, so next we can continue to Alms presentation and you can still Think about the questions directly to Lena and she will continue to the Berry group. So the floor is yours now, Alm, please. Welcome. Okay, now you can probably hear me. Yes, we can. So hello and welcome to everyone from my part also. So I will be talking briefly about uh, our company, uh, the Kappa Biotech Group, or the Kappa Group, and about wild chaga harvest, uh, chaga cultivation, our partnership model, and the world market for chaga also. So this presentation contains a lot of info, and we won't go through it all uh, really detailed, but you can have the presentation afterwards to have, a look at, uh, to have a look at it on your own. And I will also ask you to keep the questions to the end or then to the Q&A part. So let's start. So what kind of uh, business is uh, Kappa Group? So we're a biotech company working with fungi and their implementations, not only Chaga. And I am working for the part, which is in the middle of Kappa Forest, where we harvest wild Chaga and cultivate Chaga and Reishi with, together with our partners. We also have our own production line of mushroom products, which is called Kappa Health. And under that, there's the wholesale division, Nordic Mushrooms, where we, where Companies that want to sell our products under their own brands can, can order that as well. And we also have a farm where we grow several medicinal mushrooms. Right now we have about 2000 square meters of laboratory and production space and hopefully in a, in a near future we'll triple that size. So from our point of view, from Kappa Forest's point of view, our biggest asset is our growing partners who grow chaga and reishi in their forests. We are creating a large network of plantations around Finland and Sweden right now. Here's a, a product. Maybe some of you have seen it. This is a product with a, a lower processing rate for certain markets. And we also make highly processed extracts and extract powders for for markets in the that need higher processed materials so how do we get something to process when it comes to harvesting wild chaga it's important to understand that we are dealing with a organic food product 
So it sets certain limits. We can't just take any piece of chaga from anyone's backyard. But in Finland, the state offers uh, organically certified forest areas and you can buy maps for them. And we then distribute the maps to third party collectors who then collect the, the chaga and, and we buy it from them. And in Sweden, we're starting the process right now. So if anyone is from Sweden and interested in hearing more or interested in collecting wild chaga, you can be in contact with me afterwards. And we're looking right now to call, to buy around 10 to 20,000 kilos of wild chaga per year. So if you find it wild, then cultivate it. So right now, the amount of uh, available chaga is diminishing. It, it takes a while for it to grow and uh, you can't find it everywhere. So this cultivation would then open up the bottleneck. And when it comes to cultivated chaga versus wild chaga, there's some differences in terms of quality. So for an Israel market, there's a benefit in having strains that are well known and researched. So that's also a benefit of cultivating it. For our cultivation partners, one of the reasons to cultivate is the economics. Uh, you can do it as a part of your regular forestry and get some extra income. Or if you have, a, let's say, a birch forest, which isn't very profitable, uh, which will never make logs, let's say, you can make it lucrative. Here's a quick example showing what, what kind of numbers it could be for uh, uh, pulp versus, versus chaga. There's short prof profitability analysis. We won't go through this now, but in the Q&A section, we can also discuss uh, numbers more detailed and, and you can contact me as well. Another reason to, to cultivate guys is the ecology behind it. So trees that would be tinned when they're young, if they're used for chaga cultivation, you then uh, do, you bind, do you prolong the carbon cycle and you also increase amount of dead wood in the forest, which we all know is needed at the moment to, to keep the species flora the big in our forests. Another thing that uh, we've been thanked for is, is uh, the social aspect. Uh, many forest owners are happy to contribute to something that to, to health products, uh, to, to have a product which, uh, which they know are, are bringing social value and, and health to the society. So how is the chaga then cultivated? Well, we develop, we have a certain strain or a couple of strains that we have developed and researched in our laboratories and we sell out and it can be we make a contract with the forest owners and they become partners and we then promise that we will purchase the chaga when it has grown so the forest owners have two options they can either buy the materials from and then get the instructions and inoculate the chaga in the trees themselves, or they can buy the, the whole service from us. And if we perform the, the inoculation service, we also give them a 75% uh, guarantee of growability, which is fairly good. And, and our research is with, with the strains we use are, are showing very, very good prospects. Here's the partnership model explained in, in detail. So we make a plan together, look at the forests at hand and do the set, and then either choose to, uh, our value mushroom service and have our, have our team inoculate it, or you can inoculate it yourself. And after one to three years, you will see the signs of uh, growth and the first yield should be ready in about eight to 10 years. 
as it looks now. Then we harvest it. Either the forest owner can harvest them themselves or they can get the service from us. And if it's harvested correctly, chaga can then yield one or two more crops also after coming years. And after cultivation, we then suggest to, to cut down the tree and use the top for, let's say, energy or, or parts even for pulp. And uh, we can then inoculate further species into the, to the same trees. And these trees could then be left in the forest to, to decay after, after we have had all the different species grow in them. So right now, our network is all around Finland. And our biggest cultivators are actually around the Ostrobotnia region. So it suits this uh, seminar very well, seeing that it's the Kvarken region. And uh, we are now expanding also this cultivation network to Sweden. So if you have forests and uh, might be interested in cultivating chaga, you can also contact me. Lastly, I would like to say a few words about the, the market of chaga. Uh, so these numbers are estimates, partly based on customs and, and partly of big actors in the, the chaga business. And right now the, the yearly sales is around four to five million kilograms of chaga. And uh, this amount seems to be holding steady or even rising. But because of the diminishing supply or the, the diminishing supply of wild chaga, the estimate is that the production would slightly decrease in 10 years. And this is where uh, cultivation comes in to open up this kind of bottleneck. And, and it's, it's pretty, pretty, a pretty good uh, prospect for those who go into chaga cultivation right now. This, the, the explanations are in, in Finnish, so I apologize for those of you who don't, do not understand Finnish, but, but if you look at the, the last donut, you see the consumption of, of chaga worldwide, and the blue, which is, consists of almost half of it, it's uh, Russia, which also produces more or less half of the chaga in the world, and then the red one is China, and we have uh, South Korea, Japan, Canada, US, and Europe. And uh, one more benefit of the cultivated chaga is when it comes to Western world's pharmaceutical market, it's, uh, it's the key to have a researched and controlled strain, which you know has a certain quality and, and quite even quality when you harvest it. So this makes uh, research and, and development also easier. Lastly, some worries that come up when it's uh, when we talk about chaga cultivation. One uh, risk uh, is the growability, and uh, like I mentioned earlier, that we do offer a seventy-five percent growability guarantee for for the dowels we produce. And uh, how about when the crop will grow? So the big question is not whether it will grow but when it will be ready. And right now, we are estimating it will take about eight to 10 years before you have the harvest. It might be faster, it might be a bit slower, but grow it will. And then one worry we also face is thefts. And whenever we plant, uh, create a, a plantation, there is also a certificate of origin which means if you want to sell a big amount of uh, chaga, you will need, this will be demanded and uh, thus can be controlled where it, where it has come from. 
there is also the possibility of, of DNA testing the strains, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then when you make a partnership contract with us, uh, you get a purchase guarantee, which is a worry that some people have that will they get their product sold in, in eight or 10 years. And like the market is looking now, and if you make a contract with us, it, it, it's guaranteed. So thank you for listening. And if you're, if you're interested in, in more, knowing more, you can join the question and answer group about mushrooms or contact me after this and please ask for the for the slides also if you're interested in in chaga cultivation thank you thank you um super interesting uh, i think we all want to cultivate chaga now so <laughs> so you can expect emails so now we will uh, continue to Kim presentation and he will tell his his enterprise and and sub production. So please, Kim, you can start. Yes, thank you very much. So, well, <clears throat> my name is uh, Kim Finne. I'm uh, we are located here on the west coast of Finland in, in uh, 50 kilometers north of, of Vasa. Uh, we have been working with Birch Shop some time and I will give you a brief, uh, brief history. Uh, I have to start it. Okay, so there is uh, first a few slides about uh, uh, about the company, where we come from, and how we started. So, the main arguments that we have to 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 sell our product also on the international market. Uh, Finland has uh, the cleanest groundwater in the world. This is very important to to receive a, a, a nice uh, raw material for our product. Uh, we have uh, large areas of uh, organic wild food collecting areas, and we have uh, uh, pure pure water and natural forests, uh, uh, which makes makes the location very good. Uh, we have a long history also from uh, using natural products. Uh, we have uh, even in, in Kalevala, you can the national epos. You can can uh, read about birch. We use it in our saunas and for furniture and and <clears throat> so on. So it's a really special special uh, thing to 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 all things. Uh, we started this project in uh, 1998, I think. I made. Um, the first thing I made from birch sap was was a wine, uh, and uh, the wine was uh, from a Swedish uh, Swedish I, I had from the university in Umeå uh, a recipe, and I I decided that I will start to 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 try it, and it was uh, quite good. So I it it woke my interest for the product, and we continued from this. So. Uh, second, second, maybe largest step was uh, uh, a project in Finland called uh, Elintarvike Puuhanke, which was uh, a project uh, also uh, aiming to to see how to to be able to process birch sap, uh, which is spoils very easily in a better way. We took it a step at a time and uh, and also started a little bit to to. Um, Take our products to the international market to see if there could be uh, interest interest for for the product. So uh, until 2016, uh, we did not uh, uh, we did not found this company Arctic Birch, but we still made it uh, uh, sold it through other companies. We started on an island here uh, called Vestere, which was uh, I think. Uh, connected by a bridge uh, in the 80s. Uh, so it was, uh, 
the area is, is, is very nice and there is also a lot of forest owner that had, was interested to, to participate in the project and to start to, to work with us to develop the product. Uh, we started really small. We had uh, just uh, a few clients, uh, but already from the start, we, we could see that this is a product not maybe for the Finnish market. We, we started to, to uh, go international already from the beginning. There are a few uh, things that is very, very uh, um, special about Birdsap and this is the limited harvest time is one of these you only have a short period of time where you have to to harvest everything and the secondly that it's very sensitive and it spoils very very easily uh, 2016 uh, my me and my partner i have a, a, another company also called arctic food and and um, uh, my partner at S.A. Granholms, we we uh, founded arctic birch uh, we started uh, the development process to, to process birch sap without adding preservatives because this was the, the biggest challenge uh, of all. Uh, this will enable us to, to send uh, the product because many companies do not want the product to be uh, pasteurized, for example, to, so that it will spoil any of the, the beneficial uh, uh, the beneficial substances in the in the bird sap. Uh, landowners were contacted, or actually, we did not need to to contact any landowner here. Uh, we had uh, uh, everyone contacted us and asked if they could uh, participate in this project, and uh, in and also uh, be a supplier for our company. And uh, as I said we were in the beginning really small we had maybe five or six suppliers today i think we have more than 120 suppliers and uh, the area is uh, somewhere between 3500 and 4000 uh, hectares that we have uh, certified organic because um, we work in the the way that we we uh, uh, do the certification work for the for the landowners if they want to join and in this way they can also uh, supply for us because we are only handling organic birch sap at this moment. Uh, Lena showed us earlier a little bit also from analysis of raw materials and soils and, and this was uh, uh, something that we worked together with Centria about and uh, very happy to to be able to to work with the, with the universities close by. Uh, we could see that, the, that there was a growing interest for birch sap and we had uh, a larger, larger requests. So um, we, we had to, to invest or stay small. And uh, we decided that we will invest. And in, the, in our area was, uh, uh, diary plant facility for sale uh, that used to belong to to Valio one of the or the largest uh, diary uh, company in Finland and uh, we purchased this uh, uh, to be able to have a larger warehouse and have much uh, better conditions for for uh, production it was a bold investment and uh, our aim is also to, to rent uh, excess space for other manufacturing companies. So this is also um, a possibility, uh, I think for the future that there could be more than one uh, company doing more than one product at one, one place, which would facilitate the, the sales of the product that you could have a, a bigger portfolio of products. Uh, plant water, uh, birch sap is a plant water. It's uh, in the same category as, for example, coconut water. Uh, it's an increasing category of beverages. Uh, it's um, 
following in the footsteps of coconut water, which, which was also almost unknown 10 years ago. Um, we are aiming for uh, cosmetics companies uh, that is seeking added value for their products. So we have uh, also a few um, cosmetics companies in our portfolio. Uh, we have tried to, to promote the products around the globe. So we have been several times to Asia and the US and also in Europe to uh, different kinds of fairs. And uh, we have uh, at the moment sales in, in, in Europe, Asia and the US, but our main focus area at the moment is uh, Asia. The challenges for, for BirdSap, uh, I would say it's the, maybe the, the visibility and research and product development. There is also uh, cash flow because you have to buy everything at a certain uh, point of time of the year and, and, uh, and try to predict the sales, which can sometimes be uh, quite uh, challenging. Uh, there are limited resources, not in the way that it's uh, uh, birch that can be harvested to quite large amounts. We, we have uh, harvested around uh, 450,000 liters, uh, uh, except for last year where we uh, harvested uh, less. Um, there is the security of supply is always uh, challenging because in our case, we are not selling everything in bottles. We are also selling a lot in, in, in bulk shipments. And then there are trade issues to some countries that can be, be difficult. Still, we believe in the product. We think it has a, a very nice uh, future. It's uh, uh, also uh, sustainable. It's good for the biodiversity because uh, we have uh, a lot of pine and sprouts in our forests. And in this way, we have more birch trees and, uh, and it's uh, a good thing. We have a lot of properties of the SAP, even if we would uh, like that it would be even more researched in the future. Uh, so, uh, so that we can tell to our clients what kind of beneficial uh, substances there are in the bird SAP. There are growth opportunities in both bulk and consumer packages in, in new forestal products. Uh, we, uh, from Alm, we heard about chaga, which is also something that we have uh, uh, in our forests uh, planted quite a lot, uh, waiting for the for the harvest. But it takes some years, so it's um, not a it's not a quick fix. But uh, anyway, uh, there are leaves, and there are also a lot of other products that we we are looking into in in the in the future. We. Uh, like to think that increased cooperation would benefit all because um, spoke last week to one of the major major supermarkets in in Finland and uh, in, from their point of view they think that uh, birch sap producers should join together to to inform uh, inform the customers more about the benefit benefits of birch sap it's difficult because now no company is, is at the moment very big and no one has the resources to do this work. So this is something that could maybe for the future also be, be something for this, this project. The key factors for future growth is, um, and the processing is, is the difficult part, quality assurance and product development. And there is a, a joint warehouse for distribution, maybe not only our product, maybe there can be also other products in, in this that we can work, work with together. Sales and, and marketing is also uh, uh, one, one challenging part of the, the future. So uh, this what, was what I would like to share with you and uh, uh, you are free to, to ask questions uh, later on when we start the next uh, session. So, thank you.
Thank you a lot, Kim. Very interesting. And now we, of course, should be drinking those birds up drinks when you yes, when you saw us the, the pictures. Yeah, if we would have the face to face to face seminar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but now we will continue with uh, Martin Payu, who is from SLU, and he will tell of his uh, project with the Berry Corporation. Welcome, Martin. Oh, thanks. Everybody hear me? The technique yes. goes on. Yeah. Uh, I will just share my screen here. Uh, I think this will work. Or do you have the full? Yes, we can see your presentation. Yeah, very good. Thank you for inviting me to your workshop. It's uh, very interesting to hear different experience from this non-wood forest products. The, the concept is uh, pretty new for me. Uh, as I was presented as a representative for SLU, Swedish, um, the, the University for Agriculture Science in Sweden, but uh, I'm a, a researcher at the Center for Regional Science at uh, Umeå University, and we have a huge collaboration with uh, the SLU, um, the University for Agriculture Sciences in Sweden, just to be clear who I'm representing in this context. Uh, and uh, so I will uh, give you some brief um, uh, explanations on what uh, the narratives of wild berries, the scientific network for interdisciplinary collaboration is. Uh, let's see here. Uh, now, yeah. Uh, uh, the government in Sweden did uh, perform some money for uh, enhanced uh, the research on rural studies in Sweden. So we applied for some money on the concept of wild berries and uh, the prob uh, uh, to, to give some uh, views on how the, uh, uh, how the development on, on the berry industries in Sweden could uh, possibly also enhance rural development in, in Sweden. I think you're very familiar with these um, uh, connections between these two. But um, uh, And these are the, the partnerships that uh, started the, the network, which um, embrace uh, researchers and uh, practitioners from uh, industry and also from the uh, authorities that works with uh, different uh, aspects of uh, food supply and food security in, in Sweden. And we also have par uh, partners from the um, uh, voluntary sector. And uh, these um, we are, are now approximately 40 uh, members in this network and uh, the, the disciplines that uh, are just now in the, in the network in, in an academic way is what you can see here in the list. It's a pretty um, uh, it's a broad perspective of different researchers that are interested in wild berries and it's uh, possible uh, different aspects that could enhance uh, the Swedish economy and also the public health. Uh, and I'm, I just uh, have this as an example of uh, different kind of um, knowledge disciplines that are represented in the network. Uh, and the purpose of this network but which i am coordinating is uh, it's much uh, based on a different kind of narratives and perceptions that uh, are developed around the wild berries uh, and we will also problematize this uh, picture and these narratives to to give a background for policymakers to to give a, a um, better understanding 
of how to enhance the, the, the policy and the industry in the wild berry uh, uh, branches. And um, we had some questions to just to get started. And there was uh, a huge interest for different kind of opportunities within the berry industries. What kind of uh, challenges uh, do they address? And uh, how can the, the research and the academia help them to get uh, better understanding for their um, tasks in this um, in this area and we also had a, a lot of interest on different kind of values and perspectives on local food production and sustainable development and uh, according to sustainable development i can tell you i don't know the the situation in finland but uh, there are um, numbers that indicates that uh, there are very very low part of the berry uh, harvesting and uh, raffinating, uh, I don't know the English word really, <laughs> uh, uh, where to, um, which stays in the, in the local economy uh, where the berry is uh, really harvested. There are huge companies coming out with their pickers who are often recruited from abroad and they harvest a lot of amount of um, berries in the forest, uh, and then they, they leave the local economy with the resources and uh, the, the refinement and the economy is developed somewhere else. So uh, that is uh, one of the, the tasks that uh, drives this um, network. Uh, and then we have some kind of uh, uh, themes that we we did um, develop from from this, uh, uh, where we the wild berries are carriers of various qualities and benefits, like uh, that. You the other presenter here has addressed the foods with specific nutrients, and also. Uh, from the government, there are a huge interest for uh, the vulnerability in food supply in Sweden. And of course, there are also aspects like regional identity and marketing. How can we, we uh, enhance a place for the tourism industry based on different kinds of natural resources? And we also have uh, sustainable business models along this entire value change from picking raw material handling, including transport and fractionation and processing, distributing and marketing, and to sales to different kind of uh, demand. Uh, and the third one, production related aspects like technology and logistics. And also how can we, in a better way, uh, get access to the berry in, in the forest. Uh, and therefore, we have some scientists that are interested in the berry forecasts in a techno way. And I also have to mention that in, this, uh, in Sweden, we have the, the Allemansrätten, which is called, uh, basically the, the, the law of property rights. And, and uh, uh, there are uh, restrictions here uh, from uh, that the, the landowners uh, want to have better control over this, uh, the berry amount volumes in Sweden, but they, they are uh, some kind of tensions between this right of public access and, and uh, landowners. So we have some activities during the, the 2020 and 2021, like meetings, seminars and conferences. Uh, to have some knowledge exchange within the network. And we also uh, have applied for some financing of uh, research and network maintenance in the long term. Uh, these numbers uh, uh, about the berry harvesting in Sweden, which I uh, have understood is much more lower than in, in the Finnish example, uh, it's from 2013, but it uh, has not been so much changing during the time. 
And uh, here you can see that the blue berries is, uh, had the majority of, of the, the harvest end. The, this picture has been changing over time because in, in the 40s and the 50s in Sweden, there was a huge demand for lingon with co-berries in English. And then you can see the cloud berries is a small interest, but it's a, a small sector in the berry industry. And uh, there is also uh, uh, some estimating that uh, uh, approximately 90% of the whole harvesting uh, volumes in Sweden are going for export. So there is a little uh, uh, part of the berries harvested in Sweden that goes to consumers in our country. So it's basically uh, health uh, um, arguments and um, cosmetic arguments that drives different demands around uh, the world, where, which these companies are exporting. And then you can see we have a, 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 a line here, the green one that tells us something about where our pickers are coming from, which is mainly from Thailand. So that was a, a short brief of our network in, uh, in the collaboration with Finnish uh, institutions and SLU and Umeå University. If you want any further information, so please visit this uh, uh, websites or send me an email. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.